Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And we say a big God bless you. If you're viewing with this, we say thank you. We extend the grace and the peace of God in your home, in your heart. We thank you for the fellowship. We thank you for all the good uh, that we're doing over the live stream. I say share this gospel. Preach the word. Invite. Share. Whatever form of the media you're viewing on, uh, share that opportunity. The gospel is going into many homes, and we're going to share one at a time. So thank you for all that you're doing. Our church and extended family inside, we call it my church. We've interceded. We've called on the name of the Lord. The atmosphere is in here. Conducive that your prayers can be heard and answered. So release your faith with us as the worship and the prayers go forth. I believe God will let not one of us leave the same way we came. Let's lift our hands. It's a sign that our hearts are yielded open. So, Father, with lifted hands and yielded hearts, we welcome your presence afresh and anew. Send your glory, send your presence, anoint the praise and the worship. And most importantly, Lord, anoint that word. Let that word be sown in our hearts as seed. Let that seed grow and mature. Let it bring out a duplicate harvest again and again and again. We give you thanks, we give you praise, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Oh, it may be raining outside, but we're believing God's Spirit will pour out the day inside. Hallelujah. Glorify the Lord. Glorify the Lord. Praise His holy name. Let the trumpet sound, let the bells ring. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We worship Him. Glorify the Lord. Praise His holy name. Praise His holy name. Let the trumpet, Let the trumpet sound. Let the bells ring. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Come on in. Praise His holy name. Everybody sing. Everybody sing. God is holy. God is holy. And He's worthy. And we worship. We worship Him. Magnify him. Magnify him. God is holy and he's worthy. And we worship, we worship him. Glorify him. Come on and magnify him. Magnify him. God is holy and he's worthy. And we worship, we worship him. Glorify. us this morning. Take all that we have for your glory and honor. Take all. Take all.
you on this morning. I will, I will bless the Lord forever. And I will trust him. I will trust him at all times. For he
Thank you, worship team. Good morning, everybody. Before we seated today, I'd like to pray a prayer for you. Uh, those that are watching us over social media, we have a tremendous amount of rain and stormy weather here. Well, we got a, a lot of folks in church, and I want to say a special prayer. Because I truly believe when we go an extra mile for God, He does something extra for us. So could you bow your heads and offer, let me offer this prayer. Father, I thank you for each and every person that's they brave the weather, push through the storms to get here today. And in the office of a bishop, as I stand before you humbly today, I thank you for that office that I occupy, and I pray a bishop's blessing. I don't know what exactly a bishop's blessing will be on each individual life, but you do. So I pray a bishop's blessing, and I ask that it be manifested in the next seven days. In the next seven days, let them know a bishop's prayer was answered from church on Sunday. In Jesus' name I pray, and everyone says amen, amen and amen. God love you today. We're going to have a wonderful service. I also feel I need to add something in here uh, as to what I'm feeling. I'm sensing in the spirit a turning, a changing, a shifting, and I, I'm feeling in the spirit that we're about to enter into a season of miracles and healings. Now, sometimes you wonder why we don't see more of that but I believe there are seasons for things. And I'm not saying the season is here already, but I'm feeling the turning and it's coming in our direction. So keep that in mind in your prayers. If you need a miracle, if you need a healing, this is a good place. And we believe in it. We've preached it now for 45 years. So come expecting to receive. Somebody say today, I'm expecting to receive. Now, last week I preached on the subject, Dare to be Different. And in that message, there was a few points that I want to cover again. And if you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. Daring to be different is man's emergence from impersonation. Catch the word impersonation. Emerging from impersonation. Impersonation is self-imposed, and here's a new word, nonage. Nonage. What's nonage? Nonage is the inability to use one's own uniqueness. If God thought enough of each one of us to give us a different set of fingerprints, no two prints are exactly alike. That tells me he pays a tremendous amount of attention to our individuality and our uniqueness. If God thinks that much of us as an individual, should we not pay more attention to that fact and not be a copycat, but be an original? Today, I'm stirring you up to appreciate your originality. I appreciate when I see certain things happen, even as I saw them this morning, it does good things in me. Let's stand for the reading of the word. Our reader, Dr. Debbie Radosta, she'll read the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 19. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. 
and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for originality. We thank you today that we have the capacity to be and to do something no one else has done. It may be on our job. It may be a fresh new idea. It may be ministry. It may be something I'm not even mentioning, but because we are originals, we should expect original things to come out of us. We don't need to practice knowledge. We do some knowledge. We admit that, but we don't need to practice it. We need to practice originality, being what you created us to be. No more, no less. We thank you today as we move forward in this message that our social media church, our church here in New Iberia, Louisiana at Faith Cathedral, that their spirit will come up, up, up to embrace the idea there's greatness in me and I need to pay more attention how to find that greatness. In Jesus' name I pray and everyone says amen and amen. God love you and God bless you. Catch these words because they're true words. Originals are always worth more than copies. I'm going to say that again. Originals are always worth more than copies. Scripture to back it up, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How many of you believe a new creation is an original? We're made in the image and likeness of Christ, but you and I, as taking on that spirit, are originals in the fact that Christ in us is the hope of glory. Let me show you a picture today. Anybody ever saw that picture before? On December the 14th in 1962, President Charles de Gaulle from France placed a hundred million dollar purchase order for Mona Lisa. By 2022, that figure has risen to over $1 billion. Mona Lisa was painted by Leonardo da Vinci. There was a song that won an Oscar for the original score in 1950 by Nat King Cole. And part of the lyrics said, The Lady with the Mystic Smile. Now, can I be frank and truthful today and honest from my heart? You got that picture up there? I never saw that as a real beautiful woman. You say, well, a lot of people think that she's scrumptious, she's the most beautiful. I like my wife's eyebrows. <laughs> Pastor Wanda's got beautiful eyebrows. Mona, she needs some help. <laughs> but because the painting wasn't original and has endured the test of time, and of course, Leonardo da Vinci was a great inventor. He also was a painter, did a lot of different things. It carries quite a price tag. Now, you know I'm setting you up. If, you, if you're new to the church, Bishop likes to set you up. I'm setting you up. Okay, what are you doing? Okay, so there's something that's put on a canvas that's worth a billion dollars. If you could put on a canvas the words, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Those are the words that Simon received from Father in heaven. How much value do you think that would be worth? How many souls have been saved 
because of thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And notice that it came from Father. It was said by faith long before Jesus ever went to a cross. And what a reward it is as Simon discovered the reality of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, and what has happened over time and what is still happening, not only in the world but to us, even those of us who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, there's still wonderful things that are taking place. I have to say it for the record. Some folks think being a Christian is boring. It's the most exciting thing I've ever experienced in my life. Say, how is that? Because God always, always, always has something new for you. Can you give him praise this morning? Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's look at a little history for a second. Caesarea Philippi is where this account takes place. It's an ancient name of Dan. You'll find that in Genesis 14, 14. It was named by Philip, the brother of Caesar, who rebuilt it and beautified it, and he gave it the name Caesarea in honor of Tiberius Caesar, his brother, who was the reigning emperor. However, he perpetuated his own fame, and that's why he called it Caesarea Philippi. Now, there's a mystery there. If man can do that and take part credits, and we become Jesus on the earth today, don't we realize that God is going to give us our credits when we stand before him? I wonder what's in your legacy. I wonder whose life you've affected that you don't even know you've affected. I wonder how many people when you get to heaven are going to come up and you won't know them immediately and they're going to introduce themselves to you and say, you prayed for me. You prayed for somebody who prayed for me. You prayed for somebody who knew somebody who prayed for me. And I just want to thank you because that led me to the altar of salvation. I have a feeling there's a lot more that we don't know about than what we know about. Catch that again. I believe there's a lot more you don't know about than what you know about. He says, who do men say that I the Son of Man am? Notice the word am, important word. Moses got that word from God at the burning bush when God told Moses, I am that I am. Am in the Hebrew language comes from the word hayah. H-A-Y-A-H. -H. It spells the same frontwards or backwards. And it means three things. Reality, existence, life. If I could paraphrase that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's saying, I am reality. I am existence. I am life. And I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Point number one. God brings questions in life to identify true reality. There's questions that we have, questions that others have. Questions are good because it brings us to what true reality is. How many of us know this that we have here is a reality, but it's not true reality because Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. So true reality is in his word. Let me give you 10 of the biggest questions that man asks. Do you have those listed today? Give us the first one, Debbie. Why should I believe in a God I can't see? There are many things that we can't see. Air, atoms, vibrations. Heat, cold, we can't see them, but they're real. Just because you can't see something doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Common sense plays to let us know that all of this couldn't just happen by some kind of mere coincidence. There has to be a supreme being that put these things in place. Next question. Why does God allow suffering? And that's a good question. 
I really don't know that answer, but I can tell you this much about it, that suffering is used by God for man to know that he needs a Savior. Most of us don't come to Jesus when we're on top of the mountain. Most of us come to Jesus when we're in the valley, when we're hurting, when we're suffering. So as to why God permits it, I don't have that answer, but I can tell you that he uses it for his glory. Next question. Hasn't Christianity caused many wars? Answer to that, yes. But Christianity didn't invent war. We're told that there was a fight for good and evil from the very beginning in heaven. War broke out in heaven. Michael and the archangels cast out Lucifer, who became the devil on earth. So let's not give Christianity credit for war. But yes, there are wars because of the fight of good and evil. Next question. Has science disproved the Bible? Answer to that, no. In fact, for the first time, scientists are in the middle of a revelation. If you went back 10 years ago and you asked a coalition of scientists, do you believe in God or a supreme being, it would be on the bottom side of 50%. Today, I've got good news. Some things have happened that have caused scientists to believe more that there is a supreme being, that there is a God. And if you think that's a good number, 51% now believe that. The, the doctors have amped that up. We're talking about uh, general uh, opinions, general survey. 71% of doctors now believe that there is a God, that there is a supreme being. What has caused the upgrade? God does things in mysterious ways. Say that with me as a church. God does things in a mysterious way. They did a survey worldwide collecting information of people who were born blind, who had near-death experiences, NED they call it. These people who were born blind had all kinds of things to talk about when they were resuscitated. They saw things. They saw parents. Some of them saw heaven. Some of them saw many things. Some of them saw the doctors that were working to revive them. But there's a problem. How many of you heard there at Houston? There's a problem. How do people who have never seen tell you something they see? Think of what I'm saying. No eyesight, never saw anything on this earth, but they're having all of these supernatural things that have happened, and they've compiled the information worldwide. It's into the thousands, and it has caused the science world and the medical world to really and truly now tip the scale and believe that there's a God. How many of you believe there's God? How many of you want to stand and give God praise for Jesus today? Hallelujah. What's our next question, Debbie? What makes something right or wrong? It's God's order. God rewards what's right, and he punishes what's wrong. Next question. Is there more to life than this? Jesus said it this way. Do not worry about what you eat, what you drink, what you'll put on. Because your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all of these things will be added to you. But one of my favorite Jesus quotes is from John 10.10, 10, the latter part of it, when he says, I have come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. That tells me just about all I need to know. Next question. What is the meaning of life? Well, here's the Bible definition. He says, and for his pleasure, you were created. God created you for his pleasure. 
ponder that. We use the word uh, from the Bible, sila. It means stop, pause, meditate. In other words, don't run past from that too quick. God created you for his pleasure. Wow. God gets pleasure out of my life? Yes, he does. And he loves you with an everlasting love. Even before you knew him, he loved you. Even when you messed up, he loved you. Even when you sinned, he loved you. He didn't love the sin, but he loved you. He made you unique. He brought you upon this earth because you give him pleasure. Next question. What's so special about the Bible? The Bible is the only book that's breathed on, inspired by the Holy Spirit from A to Z. Other books have inspiration. The Spirit can even speak on certain things in other books. But this one, it is inspired by the Holy Spirit, breathed on by the Spirit from Genesis through Revelation. Now you say, well, how do you know that? Other books, when you read information and you go back and read it again, Basically, you already know what you're reading. When you read from the Bible, the Spirit sometimes brings things to you that you've never seen before. How many of us have read things a hundred times? Then we read a scripture and all of a sudden it's like, I never saw that before. That's Holy Spirit. Next question. What must I do to be saved? Well, the answer is from Romans 10 and 9. 9. It says, Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. So I speak to our media church out there. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. What a great, great encouraging word. And then our next question Will I see my loved ones in heaven? Well, let me give you this evidence. On the Mount of Transfiguration, there were three people that appeared to Peter, James, and John. Moses, Elijah, and of course Jesus was transfigured. Moses died a natural death and was buried by angels. Elijah was taken to heaven in a whirlwind fiery chariot. Yet we see that though they were away, one in heaven, one dead, they were all alive in the presence of the Lord himself. Yes, you're going to see your loved ones in heaven. How many of you think that when you see your loved ones in heaven, you're going to get a smile on your face? I was telling Sister Marilyn, I hope you don't mind me sharing this this morning. I had a dream last night and I saw we were at a huge convention center, and I knew that I was to be the speaker. And Marilyn and her mother came walking in the foyer area. They were dressed. Whoo! I'm going to tell you what, there was nothing short on your tires. And your mama was radiant. There was such a glow about both of you. So guess what? Who do you know? Who do you love? What family member has already gone home? Don't be too sad because the next time you see them, they're not going to be sick anymore. <laughs> they're not going to have trouble anymore. They're not going to be a problem anymore. Yes, emphatically, you're going to see your family in heaven. And by the way, yeah, we can give the Lord praise for that. At our church faith cathedral, we have made a declaration for all of the members, and the declaration is this. All of your family will be saved. Do you want to praise him one more time for that? You know, Jesus wasn't ignorant of what people had to say about him, yet he asked that question. He saw the pilgrimages of the hundreds, thousands of people climbing the mountainside to get to these false god temples that they had built to worship other gods. But he still wanted the disciples to take notice, and he wanted to bring them to true reality. They're seeing 
all of these people going up, different temples, worshiping gods, but he wants to bring his disciples, even as he wants to bring us, into true reality. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Point number two. God's grace is given through knowledge of the Christ. Notice here how this unfolds, and it says that they had an answer to give him. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When they climbed the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw Moses, they saw Elijah. Here, the disciples didn't quite know what to say. So this is how they answered him. They said, Lord, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets, or John the Baptist raised from the dead. That didn't stop at four. It's no coincidence that they gave four renderings of groups of peoples. You're one of these groups of people. But Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? Notice that out of the 12 apostles, only Simon answers. 11 were silent. Why were they silent? Because that had not been revealed to them yet. Sometimes God gives us revelation personally. Other times he'll give it to us through other people. But um, let me show you a picture here of Caesarea Philippi. Here's a picture of an old ancient temple in Caesarea Philippi. All that's left there is the remnant. And this is what people went when the temple was all built to worship these false gods. They're still there for us to see today. But the important part of the new biblical numerology, you know I'm big into that. I pay a lot of attention to numbers. So, you know, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah one of the prophets, some believe you're John the Baptist raised from the dead, but who do you say I'm in? Simon speaks up, he said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Now we've got five choices. Jesus becomes the fifth of their possibilities. Five is the number of grace. Five is the number that God says is amazing grace. How many of you could say what happened to me in my life when I came to Jesus was nothing short of amazing grace? Grace is unmerited favor. My definition for grace is God's ability. Uncommon favor is when God causes somebody to desire to be a problem solver in your life. I always pray for uncommon favor. Point number three. Reality of Jesus Christ comes only by personal revelation. Peter answered for the whole group when he said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. It had a twofold purpose. First, it was to let us know that he had a personal revelation. Second, it was for instruction to the others who didn't have it yet. God didn't leave them out. It's a very important thing to understand that God gives us through personal revelation a testimony. How important is your testimony? Look at Revelation 12 and 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Sometimes folks tell me, well, you know, I'm not a preacher. I don't know that much about the Bible. Um, I would like to win souls for the Lord, but, you know, I, this, is, this is different. And some people say, I'm just a shy person. Well, one of us could say that, but the majority of us would say, I've had a testimony. Your testimony never grows old. How you come to Jesus never grows old. Where you were when you got saved never grows old. You can tell it a million times, and it will always carry 
and anointing because it is personal revelation to you. Let me tell you my story. Pastor Dave, my natural brother, and I were raised in a traditional religion. We were altar boys. In those days in the city we lived in, it didn't have sidewalks. So Daddy would not let us ride our bicycles to church. We served as altar boys, except if we went on the levee. So we would climb the levee, get on the levee, and we would pedal our bikes for a couple of miles to get to the church as altar boys. Later, when I was 12 years old, I was confirmed. A bishop from New Orleans came and did the confir confirmation. We were what you would call religious, but I can tell you for a truth, there's a big difference between being religious and being born again. When I got older, into my early 20s, I quit going to church, but something happened that would change the course of my life. Many times, suffering, traumatic experiences, God allows that to happen to change the course and the direction that we take. I uh, had an accident. I was put into the hospital. At that time, I was district manager of an insurance company in New Orleans. That was a good job. They did the first surgery. It was not totally successful. They had to do a second surgery. I spent 50 days in the hospital. On the day I was to have my second surgery, my big boss, regional director, came and told me he was putting me on disability because they had to have a manager to run the office. Bottom line is, is my paycheck went from over 1000 a week down to 125 When I got out of the hospital, by the way, the hospital was Mercy Hospital in New Orleans. Boy, I needed mercy at that time, too. When I got out the hospital, the reality began to set in me. You cannot balance a budget that you're used to spending 1000 a week with with 125 It don't work. And I was getting very depressed. I was so depressed. I owned racehorses. I had five racehorses with my cousin. And I say it in humor now, we had a stakes winner. Uh, this horse made a couple hundred thousand dollars for us. But when God put his finger on me, that horse couldn't have won a potato sack race. God stopped everything. Down to 125 a week, race horses not winning. It all came to a screeching halt. I was in depression. I went to the stable. My, my cousin was there that morning, and I said, Lou, I said, Man, I, I feel like I'm having a nervous breakdown. Lou scratches his head, and he's a big fellow like I am, nice man. And Lou said, well, sound like you need some religion. I said, where do I find it? Scratched his head again. He said, I don't know, but I see a lot of cars at that faith church on Reed Boulevard in New Orleans here. So why, why, why I am so partial to Wednesdays, services. It was a Wednesday that I made my way to Faith Church in New Orleans. Dr. Charles Green was the speaker. He spoke a great message. Numbers of people came to the altar for salvation. So did I. And when I got down to that altar, I could only bend one knee because of the back surgery. I was on crutches. So I put one knee down. I had to leave the other one straight. And boy, I mean, I was serious with God. I was more serious with him than I'd ever been before. And I said, Lord, if you get me out of the mess I'm in, I'll give you the rest of my life. And I meant it from the fibers of my being. The rest of us got up to be dismissed, and I had another quick moment. I went back to the altar. The rest were leaving to go into another room where they could receive more counsel. I knelt down and I said, Lord, if you get me out of this mess, I'll take a job that nobody else wants. My word to you, be careful what you tell God. That testimony 
will be anointed all the way into eternity. That's my testimony. But you've got a testimony. Your testimony is the reality that Jesus is alive. Your, your testimony is the reality that God takes messes and turns them into miracles. I can't tell you that I had some instantaneous, super-duper miracle with all of the back surgeries and all. I can tell you this. I never had the third one. They were talking about doing a total fusion on my back. Till this day, I've never had the third one. From that point at that altar, I started getting better and better and better. And God was blessing me. And in, in a short time, with $125 a week, he met every single need. He also let my racehorses start winning before he convicted me. And then I had to give my racehorses away. But it was nice for a little while. But uh, anyway, the point being is this. What was true reality? What's true reality in your life? What's really real? It's not about this. It's not about houses and cars, jobs. It's not about clothes, food. It's not about entertainment. All of this stuff is going to come to an end. True reality is all about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, the lover of your soul. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world by him could be saved. He loved you. He loves you. No one can give more than their life. Jesus said, there's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And he told his disciples before he died, today, I call you my friend. He knew he was going to lay that life down, but not just for those disciples, for you, for me. So why should we think less of ourselves? You're unique. You're beautiful. Everything is beautiful in its own time. Why should I be depressed over the goings-on that's in the world? The world will always have its traumas. I should be overjoyed because my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I have a testimony that nobody ever had or ever will have just like my testimony. Does it make you feel good? Can you praise him one more time today? <laughs> Point number four. You must be born again to see and enter the kingdom of God. Let's just continue reading John 3, 1 through 8. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, a Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, but no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from. And where it goes, so is everyone who is born, born of, of the, the Spirit. Spirit. What are the keys that he promised Simon? The keys 
to the kingdom of God. There's a big difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. It's a matter of heart versus head. Let me say it again, a matter of heart versus head. The revelation of who he is has to come in the heart. You can read about him. I'm not saying reading about him or religion is bad. There's nothing wrong with that part. But until it leaves the head and comes into the heart. How did God uh, deal with my heart? I had to open it up enough and cry out enough to give him a place. It took that kind of trauma in my life to make me humble enough. I had reached a point where man couldn't help me anymore. Most people come to that place where man can't help you anymore. That opens us up so that Jesus can come and live in the inside of our heart. I got another picture here of a great man of God. Some of you recognize him. That's Brother R.W. Shambach. And he's talking here in this particular image about the born-again experience. But I love the way Brother Shambach ended his radio program. I used to love to listen to him. Very, very encouraging man. And this is how he ended his program. You don't have a problem. All you need is faith in God. Point number five. The reward for revelation of Jesus or the keys to the kingdom. And we've got a picture of keys. Some people think because he mentions binding and loosening that there's only two keys. No. All of the keys are relative to those two particular things, but there's many, many keys. I want to read again from uh, Matthew 16 and 19, but from the Amplified Bible, it gives us a little clarity. Debbie? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth, must be what is already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, declare lawful on earth, must be what is already loosed in heaven. So he brings into the picture, there's many keys. But whatever you use as a key for whatever it is that you need, it has to be lawful in heaven. Now, here's another thing that usually when we talk about binding and loosening, folks grab the word binding and you hear people praying all the time, boy, I bind that devil. I bind this. I bind that. But let me give you another instance of binding. How many of you believe there's love in heaven? How about binding some of heaven's love? How many of you believe that there's a lot of good things in heaven? How many of you need a good thing this week and bind it to you? So it's not just the negative. Yes, I'm not putting down that you can bind the devil. But how about binding some good things? I had a man one time <clears throat> that I looked into his eyes and I, I honestly saw Jesus in his eyes. I didn't see Jesus on his face. But for that moment in time, I saw Jesus' eyes. And I told him, I said, I see Jesus in your eyes. Kind of shocked him. But I see Jesus in a lot of eyes. I see folks here that I've grown to love over 36 and a half years of service here. Many of you have been with us for a long, long time. And when I look at you, I don't just see you. I see Jesus in you. Pastor Jeanette is working with one of our members right now. The Tanetti's brother Tanetti had a toe removed and a part of his foot removed. And she's been calling on them and ministering to them. I see Jesus in you, Jeanette. How many of you think if Jesus was here, he'd be doing some of these same things? When you go out and you tell people about your testimony, you're allowing them to see Jesus. What great things. 
you know, when I became born again the first year, all I did was study, and I was blessed to have great teachers. But as time goes on, I was brought into ministry. And they were talking about, at the time that I had the accident, my name was already uh, being brought up to be the youngest regional director in the history of that insurance company. Of course, the accident stopped that. But that's a high, high, big, big paying job. I tell you for a truth. I wouldn't trade all of the insurance regional director salaries in the whole world for what I've experienced as a minister for Jesus Christ. The only one that stood up that I saw was Chef John. I love that man, and I love his wife, Annie. You've been around great chefs. You are a great chef. How many of you have ever eaten anything from, how many, when I say he cooks good food, great food, don't you want to praise God for it? I applaud him, too. You could take, and they could offer you, say, we have a position as the top chef in the world. All you have to do is you've got to move your family, and we're going to pay you millions of dollars a year to be on TV and tell the secrets that you've learned as a chef. But, John, because Jesus lives in you, you'd say you can offer me all of the money in the world. I wouldn't take it and lose what I've got inside of my heart because that's how much Jesus means to me. Here's another example. This is going to make Pastor Sampy smile. Put that next picture up there. You know, you know who that is? That's Dr. Leroy Thompson. Now, I said there's many keys. And you know, some parts of the body of Christ condemn other parts of the body of Christ to have a different key. But just because somebody else has a different key doesn't mean that they're bad. They're different. Here's a man that has a unique ministry. I've told this story before, but we've got some new ones here, so I'll say it. He started doing some really weird things as a preacher. They thought maybe he was having some kind of a breakdown. He'd come up there, and he'd spend minutes every service, and he'd be doing this. And it took a while, but finally one of his, Pastor Joe's, had enough courage to say, Dr. Thompson, you grabbing things like there's something. He said, money coming, money coming, money coming. He said, it's in the spirit, and I've got to bring it to the natural. Money coming. In Darrell, Louisiana, in a, a, sound, a town of just a couple of hundred people, he has a church of 2,000. Money coming. Listen what he preached. He preached freedom, financial freedom in Christ. How many of you think that God wants you to be out of debt? Oh, I got a prayer in me for that. If you have some debt and you're ready to come out of debt, if you'll stand, if you'll stand where you are, I'm going to pray for that, to become debt-free, debt-free. Today's a bishop's prayer day, debt-free. Father, you see the people who are in debt for various amounts, various things, but Lord, I truly believe in my heart that there's a key. You gave it to Dr. Thompson. He unlocked it, and he has become very prosperous and very blessed. I pray that prayer over each one. Now, listen, I'm going I'm to I'm move you spiritually. Now, you know, people are going to think you're a little weird when you start coming here. I, that's okay. Jesus was considered weird, too. I want you to do what Dr. Leroy did. I want you to reach up and say, money coming, money coming. You too, money coming. Wanda, you too, money coming, money coming, money coming. Now add to it, to me, in Jesus' name. Now give him some praise today. Hallelujah. Please be seated. I'm close, I'm close to the end here. 
So he began teaching people how to live the life of faith. We do some of that here. How to walk by faith and not by sight. We do some of that here. How to be well and not sick. We do some of that here. How to live and not die. We do some of that here. How to keep the devil under your feet. We do some of that here. How to live the victorious, abundant life in Jesus Christ and how to be led and controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to understand that Jesus said the poor will always be with us. But he didn't say that everybody needs to stay poor except in one place. There is a place where we need to be poor. Said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What does that poor in spirit mean? Here I'm going to tell you. It means dependency on God. It means I don't have the answers, but I know who does. It means man can't always help me, but I can always turn to you for my help. It means I put Jesus Christ first in the order of priorities in my life. It means I believe that Jesus said there's no way to the Father except by me. And I'm so glad that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to give you these as I close. We didn't have these for the overhead. Proper reality. No way to the Father except by Jesus. Your revelation needs voice activation. It's not just about the revelation you got. You have to tell it to somebody. The voice of God is revealed on the earth. I'm in lesson four this Friday night, how to hear the voice of God seeing and noting. I'm going to be talking to you about how you can see and note things and how that God can speak to you through the things that you see and note. Friday night, 7 o'clock. Number four I've got here, rewards come from revelation knowledge. When Peter got the revelation, he was rewarded with the keys to the kingdom, and his name was changed from Simon to Peter. Power on the earth must agree with the order in heaven. So God's not going to tell you to do something that's illegal in heaven. Whatever's legal in heaven... You can do it here on the earth. The beginning of salvation is called the born again experience. You must be born again to see and to enter the kingdom. Born again is accomplished by the work of grace through faith. We close with this scripture. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Can I ask everyone to stand today? I'm about to challenge you. Or are you up to a good challenge? Okay, we had a bishop's blessing earlier, right? Bishop's blessing on you for coming today when you had a reason not to come. Now, I want to ask you to consider doing something for the Lord. I'm asking for commitments to take your testimony, and I'm not putting a time limit on this, so it can be 30 days, it can be the rest of the year, whatever is good with your spirit, but that you promise God I'm going to tell seven people between today and when I'm through about my testimony, about how you saved me. Seven people. Seven is the number of completion. Seven people. 
I can, uh, you know, I, I see mine's the wheels are spinning. Beep, 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 beep. Who, who do I know? God will help you and bring people across your path if you're willing to make that commitment. How many can raise your hand and say, I'll, I'll commit to that? Seven people. Seven people. My eyes are drawn to this young man right here. Would you come and let me minister to you for a second? You can be seated. What is this, a new, a new, a new fad? Come on up here. A one color. You know, I'm, I'm a big lady, uh, LSU ladies basketball fan. And uh, they, they got a lady right now, uh, Angel Reese. And she wears one color on one leg, and then she don't wear any color on the other leg, just her skin. So I guess that's okay. I guess it's something about the athletes. Huh? I guess it's something about the athletes. Uh -huh. You're an athlete, right? Yes, sir. What, what do you play? What do you do? I play football for Westgate High School. Okay. And what position? Receiver. I'm the one who caught that one-hand catch. Oh, that's right. I thought your face looked familiar. <laughs> hey. I'm glad you came back, back to church. Did you enjoy the service today? Yes, sir, I did. And there's greatness in you. Man, what a catch. What a catch. You made me shout. <laughs> Boy, what a catch. Did you have glue in that hand or something? No, it was on this one. On that one. I'm going to hold this one for a while. I'm going to get some of that. Stick them. God says to get ready because your unique will so make a place for you. Some have told you you're too little. You're not big enough. But I say David was little, and he took down Goliath. You will take down Goliath. I will give you the anointing to do things that big people will be envious of. You will have agility and speed and other things, the abilities to perform under pressure that others would be envious of. Because this day I am anointing you, says the Lord. I am anointing you for the originality in your life. Because you love me and you will never leave me, says the Lord. And because you've been willing to say, I will talk to seven people about my testimony, I'm going to bring much blessing to you, even on this year. Today, you are a blessed child of God. Thank you, Mr. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you raise your hand before, stand one more time. I'm about to turn it over to you, Frank. You can join me up here. Oh, I don't know if y'all got happy. Did you get happy today? I sure did. I guess Trevor's going to catch it on the, on the YouTube. He's going to get happy. But I, I really, really feel it deep in my soul that God's about to turn this thing up. I believe... I believe you're going to be surprised. Some of the people you tell your testimony to, they're going to ask you to pray for them. And when they ask you to pray for them, expect to get a miracle. There's something about expectation. I, I brought it uh, to some earlier. I said, you know, under the tent, we used to get miracles by the bushels. But when you become a church pastor, the miracles don't seem as many. I'm not saying we don't get some, but I mean, we'd have church. We never hardly ever had a church service under the tent where we didn't see a miracle. Somebody come out of a wheelchair, blind eyes open, different things happen. You don't see so many in the church, and I've had it in my spirit. Why? Why? And I truly believe God's speaking into my spirit because the expectancy level People get in a custom to go into a church, but when they come under a tent, their expectancy is so great. I'm praying for your expectancy. You've agreed to seven people. I'm expecting that your expectancy is going to be up, and when you tell your testimony, something's going to happen. Won't be surprised if he don't bring a few of his buddies from the football team to church with him. And say, so you got to come hear this man. you got to come hear this old preacher. Father, I thank you and I praise you. Say the word with me three times. Expectancy. 
Expectancy. Expectancy. Lord, when they give that testimony, they've promised to tell seven people over a period of time, but there's not just going to be words. It's going to be anointed, and the people that hear their testimony are never going to be the same again. And we're not waiting till after the fact to thank you, but we're thanking you before we even give the first testimony because we believe and we expect Something big is about to happen. In Jesus' name, and we say amen. amen. Give the Lord praise. Pastor Frank. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wonderful, wonderful. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the storehouse. So we, li we are dwelling in a storehouse. It's a physical storehouse, and uh, it's, we have that word found in Malachi chapter 3. And that's the word today, storehouse. So those of you who are unfamiliar with what we, um, how we do this, we, we use a word every, uh, for every offering, and it's a word that we name our offering. So today, if you have it using the envelopes that are in, included in the, uh, the bulletin or in the pew in front of you, just write that word somewhere on there. If you're writing a check, please write it on the check. And if you're using the online methods, uh, uh, method, singular, uh, tithe lead, just uh, put that in the memo field so that we'll know that it would service it's connected to. So the storehouse in Malachi 3.10, verses, 3, uh, verses 10 through 12, it says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. So we, the, in the first verse, in the first sentence, it says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. The storehouse. So this is a storehouse. We're a church, and what are we storing here? It's a storehouse of the Word. Let's have that. A storehouse of the Word, preaching the Word. A storehouse of love. A storehouse of kindness. A storehouse of brothers and sisters in Christ, all of you. And then those of you watching by the online methods. A storehouse of comfort. How many times do we need comfort and we, we find our, our, our solace in the, in the sanctuary with our brothers and sisters? A storehouse of support in bad times. A storehouse of prayer. A storehouse of goodness. A storehouse of guidance. A storehouse of unity. A storehouse of preaching the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And finally, a storehouse of preaching the gospel to every creature. And that's what it's all about. And that's not an exhaustive list. That's just some of the things that our church, the church, my church, that we come together and store in this place amongst, amongst all of you, a storehouse. It's not only just for, to provide, you know, pay the bills, but that's a big part of it, is to preach the gospel, all those things that we derive benefit of by being, a, being part of the congregation. So the word today is storehouse. Those of you watching um, online by the YouTube, Facebook, and uh, live stream, if you would, please use your platform and put a positive uh, um, signal on there, either a thumbs up or a like, a share, subscribe, a bell notification. Please do those things for us. It's very important, and it does work because we're seeing the numbers increase and increase. So we thank God for that. We thank God that the, the, this, these cameras and all the equipment associated with it and mostly all the people that are associated with that ministry that it, that this signal goes out to the world and fulfilling the, the, the uh, order of the Lord, huh? Our commander-in-chief, as he's leaving, he gives us his orders, and we're fulfilling that with the help of you. So we want to thank every one of you, each and every one of you, for your continued support of Faith Cathedral Ministry. We thank you for the, on, the online people for that same thing. So uh, as I was talking, the online people, you'd see these little slides pop up. It'll give you the three ways that you can get your tithe and offering to the, to the church, either bring it by mailing it or using the tithe leap program which i mentioned earlier the t-i-t-h-e dot l-y look it up on uh, on the search engine or go to the app store very easy or you can text the uh, the word give to 318-257-6462 and you can get a link it's very convenient and uh works just fine 
So we thank you again, and we want to, in the sanctuary, we're going to send the blessing over the cameras and into the fiber optics and into the world when we're going to dismiss our online audience, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the, for the ability and the provision that you've provided, Lord, for getting this word out into the world, Lord. We thank you, Father. We're obedient to your word, and you, we thank you, and we give it all back to you. We bless these people as they go. In Jesus' name, amen, and goodbye.